From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Glenn Tonzer is featured on this week's cattle market segment. Glenn will go over the latest USDA cattle inventory report. And he'll discuss the latest USDA domestic and export beef demand numbers. Then from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, Dustin Pindle, Brad White, and Bob Larson will look at the necessary elements of a cattle operation succession plan, what it takes to make a smooth transition of ownership from one generation to the next. And further ahead, Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment. He'll talk with K-State's Chris Mullins about last week's National Wildlife Habitat Evaluation Competition, hosted by Kansas 4-H. All that right here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Welcome once again to our Monday edition, where we begin on the cattle market scene and get comments from livestock economist Glenn Tonzer of K-State Research and Extension. Glenn is on the road today and uh, meeting with some of his peers from across the nation. But, Glenn, you step aside to share a few thoughts on the markets with us, including a look at the cattle on feed and cattle inventory reports issued last Friday afternoon. Before we get to that, Last week was something of a down week for the trades. We had hoped that maybe the market had bottomed out for the summer, but as per last week, not so. Yeah, the markets gave up a little bit more. I'll break it down, but we were flat down a little bit across the complex. I do think there was some hope, as you said, of holding on to past gains. But at the same time, I think there was some sitting and waiting for these reports will break down. So it'll be quite telling to see about the next few days actually doing the marketplace. But uh, let's just start in the cash market. Mm-hmm. Uh, so cash, Kansas fed cattle, closed Friday a little over 111. It's down about a buck and a half from the prior week. Uh, for context, the five-area price was about 113 on Friday. So again, we've given up a little bit from where we were before. When you look over the board, August live cattle was 107.5 on Friday, down about a dollar from the prior week. Flipping over to feeders briefly, staying on the board, August feeder cattle contract was just below 140, down almost two bucks from the prior week. Cash trade was, AMS called it, pretty uneven around the country. And I know I often say that because there's so much heterogeneity in the marketplace, but most markets were three lower to three higher, depending on which exact lot in market you would quote. A couple specific Kansas ones, uh, Dodge City Market, there was a lot of 224 head of steers at 919 pounds, went at 135 and change. And then a lot of over 500 heifers that weighed 821 pounds went at 132. Uh, those two quotes would be just a little bit uh, down to flat from the prior week. Rounding out the marketplace, the cutout was actually either flat or up, depending on which one we want to quote. So Choice closed at 213 and almost a half, up just a little bit from below 213 the week before. And then Select was literally didn't even move by 10 cents, so it was flat at just below 190. Should producers take much at all from the trends of last week, though? Modest uh, fall off in the cash and the futures, by and large, but these were not dramatic drops by any extent either. Yeah, on balance, I would call it ho hum. I mean, you are going to have some disappointment that we didn't hold what were previous lows. Agreed with your comment there. But I do think there was some sitting and waiting on these reports. And um, as we walk through those, that'll set the stage maybe for this coming week. Let's pick up then first on the cattle on feed report. It's not that often that the pre-report estimates are as spot on as they were this time around. The uh, market watchers pretty much had this report well in hand. Yeah, so a different way of saying that was there really were no surprises. So the actual numbers were right in line with the average of the pre-reports. Uh, there's always a range of multiple analysts that provide those pre-report numbers. 
and these numbers fell right in the middle of those ranges. So July 1st inventory is up 2%, June placements were down 2%, and then June marketings are down 3%. Those are all within two-tenths of a percent of expectation. So as you noted, we're kind of right on par. No real surprises here. And again, I'm going to say that's not a bad thing. Just kind of getting our arms around the supply situation and the fact that we are moving product consistent with expectations. So June markings are down 3%. That's what we expected. Placements down just a little, but that's what we expected. Those, I think, are just reaffirming that we have our hands around the base supply demand situation. So we're looking at supply stability for quite some time, it would seem, anyway. Is that how to read yeah, that? Agreed. And we've had multiple months a row of you know record inventories that continues here. But the fact that we didn't get a spike up or that marketing slowed more than expected and so forth is actually the gem that's hidden in the fact this is a no-surprise report. The cattle inventory report, now out twice a year once again, and the July account has been shared by the USDA. Again, this report does provide a regular barometer of whether there's expansion or contraction in the cow herd. What did you take from the numbers, Glenn? Yeah, so I'll, I'll remind our listeners, there's both the January and the July both those reports do exactly what you said, Eric, and give us a kind of a pulse on the industry size and we're expanding or not. The January one gives us a state-by-state number breakdown. So I could say if Kansas is expanding more or less than Texas and so forth, we don't get that from the July one. So I'll remind our listeners of that differential. But what I took from this was basically uh, we're kind of plateauing on the breeding herd size. Uh, so several of the numbers I'm going to share just confirm that we're holding steady on number of uh, beef cows and heifers. Specifically, the beef cow inventory came in at 32.4 million head. That's exactly flat with prior July of 2018. The calf crop came in flat at 36.4 million. That was just 100,000 head less than the prior July. And the number of calves under 500 pounds came in at 28.1 million, down right at 1% uh, from 28.4 million a year ago. None of those three were big surprises. The fourth statistic I made a note to talk about, I'm not going to call it a surprise, but it was down just a little bit more than pre-report, was the beef cow replacement heifers, or heifers that are held back to go into the herd for breeding. Uh, that number came in at 4.4 million, was down about 4% from 4.6 million in July of 2018. The pre-report expectations I saw were calling for about a 2% decline. So fewer heifers were being held back than the pre-report estimate was anticipating. We could kind of guess on why that happened, but if you put a bow around all four of these statistics, I'll use the same term earlier, I think we've plateaued. Uh, we're not drastically shrinking, nor are we still expanding the herd. Some of the, uh, of our listeners have seen me give outlook talks that talk about the cattle cycle, uh, eight to 12 year period from when we expand the herd, when we contract it and so forth. We do appear to be at kind of the peak inventory of this cycle. The question next is, will we see contraction? Will we see that replacement heifer number shrink even further come the next cattle inventory report? We'll, we'll have to wait six months for that, of course. We will, and this is the third July cattle inventory report where there's been a year-over-year decline. Most of our listeners know when we pull the trigger on expansion, it's this replacement heifer number that goes up first, and the cattle numbers keep going up for some time. Then we see these heifer replacement numbers drop off, and yet the inventory keeps growing to your lag story. And it does feel like we are to the point where we might start pulling the herd down, I'll say two years from now, but we'll see if the trigger uh, shows up in the January report, as you said. Specifically, feeder cattle prices for this fall, expected prices for this fall, rather, have come down notably uh, from where we were, say, last January when we were talking about the last report. So exactly what that does to optimism for those that were thinking of holding steady or maybe a few people are actually in an expansion mode. It will be interesting to see how the January inventory report flushes out once we actually incur what's very likely to be lower sale prices this October, November. Closing out, Glenn, with the latest beef demand numbers from the USDA. These covered the month of May. What did they tell us? Yeah, so there's a lag in the trade data. Uh, so that's why we're talking about May demand when we're in July. Uh, the domestic beef demand story was plus 3% in May compared to the prior month. Pork was down 2% compared to April and chicken up about 2% compared to April. I'll remind our listeners a few months ago, I started also sharing export demand indices. Beef uh, was up 9% uh, from the prior May. 
pork was up 7% from the prior May and chicken was up 20%. I'm highlighting this because we actually had several positive things show up in the May demand data. All three meats was a good story on the export front. Beef and chicken was good on the domestic front. And it sets the stage for maybe some renewed purchasing power and interest as we go through the summer. Most of our listeners recognize we're sitting in the middle of July and we've been waiting for that. And some of the concerns in the countryside is a couple of good months of demand story here that hasn't shown up yet in the cattle price complex uh, is leading to more and more discussions. And you've said it before, thank goodness for at least firm demand for beef domestically and in the export channels as well. In the absence of that, these markets would be hurting pretty badly, would they not? They certainly would be. So, I mean, I'll remind our listeners. So, for example, our feeder cattle producers, uh, we've absorbed a notable increase in grain prices and ongoing uncertainty on grain prices. And that's core to why feeder cattle prices have declined. But that decline would have certainly been greater if we haven't had some good April and May in particular beef demand estimates come out. And just as a parting thought to point out to our listeners, you'll be sharing your comprehensive beef cattle market outlook, Glenn, at the upcoming Risk and Profit Conference here at Kansas State University. So you'll have a a great deal of information to pass along there. Yeah, and so specific to this topic, uh, yes, I will be tackling it. I'm scheduled to be the last presenter. For those that haven't attended or not as familiar with it, on our Ag Manager website is brochure and so forth, August 22nd, 23rd on campus. But it's not just yours truly talking about livestock uh, marketplace. There's a whole potpourri of Ag Econ topics, both full talks and then breakout sessions. I encourage our listeners to go to agmanager.info and look at the brochure. And we'll be talking up that event as the weeks go along here, but August the 22nd, 23rd, a Thursday and Friday at the Alumni Center here on the Kansas State University campus. 2019, risk and profit. And Glenn, thanks for taking the time to share these thoughts with us. We will catch up with you again very soon. My pleasure. Thanks, Eric. He is livestock economist Glenn Tonzer of K-State Research and Extension, and we'll return shortly with more on this agriculture today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, a blueprint, if you will, for transitioning the cattle operation from one generation to the next is the central theme of the latest Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. And the recent heat stress on cattle has the group's attention as well. In the conversation this time around, livestock economist Dustin Pendle and veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White. Here's Brad. We started talking a couple weeks ago, Dustin, we really got onto this topic of risk and talked about some of the different areas of risk management. And then when we dove in a little bit to transition plans, we found out a lot of people don't have those. And I know you've dug into this a little bit and found out some information. Tell us about transition plans and how big a deal is it that we don't have one? Well, so I did start digging a little deeper after we've had to figure out what that poll was a few weeks back. And Transition plan is not, what I've learned, it's not simple. It's not something you can just, hey, get the family together on a Friday afternoon and, you know, whip that out. Plan the transition for the next Uh, one. You know, there's a lot of information available on various uh, extension websites. You know, University of Minnesota, Iowa State, Ag Manager here at K-State also has quite a wealth of information. I would imagine that K-State site's the best one. Well, I probably would agree, uh, but there's fact sheets uh, on Ag Manager. In addition, there are videos, uh, faculty that have uh, went out and give talks, and they've recorded those videos. And so there's a lot of, a lot of information on Ag Manager. But uh, one particular fact sheet I pulled off and looked at, they had 12 steps lined out to developing a transition plan. Well, it seems like it would be helpful to have some 
bite-sized steps? Because uh, I can only imagine that, it, that really developing a transition plan, like you said, is, is more than an afternoon's activity. Absolutely. And if, we'll talk through this here in a second, and you can see why you would want to take little bits at a time. And so the first step was just getting everybody together and figure out what matters most. You know, what are your, uh, what are the core values? What are the things that you want to see happen in this transition plan? So which that in itself could, I mean, I'm sure if you get enough family members together, you probably get a, uh, probably more than multiple one, opinions, multiple yeah. ideas. Yep. Uh, after you've done that, you also want to talk about what are the, uh, the needs, the wants, the hopes, and the fears. You know, what do you want out of this transition plan? What do you hope for? What do you need? What's your biggest fear? And that then, taking those kind of what matters most and, and identifying the wants, needs, hopes, and fears, that really sets you up for nice communication, right? So your family's communicating, and hopefully by that point you, you're able to come out with some kind of communication uh, that's needed. Next, you, you can establish your vision, mission statements, goals, objectives, which that's no different than any department on campus, BCI, business, for example, yep. or any other business. So you have this vision, you have, hopefully it's a commonly shared vision, goals, et cetera, more specific. Step four they've got listed here is the human resource evaluation. Uh, you've got to identify your strengths and weaknesses of individuals involved hmm. in this transition, hmm. right? So, so for example, I'll if you bet that's an interesting meeting. Oh, absolutely. So think <laughs> about if you currently have one individual that kind of does everything. Well, maybe the next generation, one's really good at the day-to-day task or maybe the production side. Whereas one maybe is just really into the business man, the management yeah. side, you know. So those are the kind of identifying those, and well, some of that might come out even in your goals and, and aspirations and what you want to do. Absolutely, no, you're absolutely correct. One, one other thing that I'm thinking about is I can see this as being a challenge when you're just talking about two generations, but a lot of our farming operations it might be three generations, which to me adds even. I mean, it's just a larger age span, and right? So priorities and stuff would change a lot from across three generations even maybe even another step greater than just between two generations yeah no i mean because you just think of uh the younger one they would just come out of college you know we were talking about this i think earlier today talking to uh college a students you know you text right if you want to get somebody quick you text well what if you have the 70 80 year old grandpa is that is that gonna so there's a lot of challenges uh the fifth step they identified is who's in charge who's in charge you know and they 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 suggest maybe just a simple organization chart you know who's in Mm -hmm. charge of all the different activities um that might provide some structure that everybody can then see and and knows okay you know so and so is is leading this number six where do we stand financially obviously this is going to be a very important one because if you're thinking transition you need to know where you're at financially and, and from here, you think some of the things we've talked about in recent episodes, you, you would need your beginning and ending balance sheets, income statements, cash flow, uh, owner's equity, et cetera. And they argue this that might be the most important step of and that all might this. take a little more time. To Could take really a little more time to, uh, but, to pull but that information. That's not their first step, though. You kind of do some of the background work before you really pull up the financial information. Right. Yep, you're correct. Uh, step seven says how... Uh, do we have what we need? So you got to basically come through what's the inventory of all available resources, you know, your assets, machineries, uh, machinery, building, land, people, mm-hmm. et cetera, uh, services, et cetera. So that's step seven. Number eight, um, interesting one, SWOT or stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. Do SWOT analysis. Uh, so you're looking at both your internal and your external. So you want to identify what you're really strong at, your weaknesses, what are some opportunities that are external opportunities and external threats? Uh, hopefully you can take those threats, turn those into opportunities, take your weaknesses, turn those into strengths. That will also, I think, will help with your the risk side. So we talked about mm-hmm. the last four, five, six weeks talking about risk management. So you, you're thinking about all the various risks when you're thinking about your weaknesses or your external threats. You know, Here's where your risk management plans come into place, at least in my mind. Uh, that was step eight. Step nine is evaluating financial feasibility. So this is thinking about the future. Not, uh, not just what we've done in the past and how much we've accumulated right. to date. Now here is going forward. <laughs> okay. You know, if we want to bring in that next generation, or maybe there's a couple uh, of, of that generation, can we do it? And if we can't, what's it going to take? 
Step 10 is developing a business plan. So once you've went through and you've got all the financials, you've got all this other information, uh, after you've defined your objectives, goals, etc., let's figure out what this business plan looks like. Step 11, estate planning, retirement planning. And so uh, that's interesting. We talked about a transition plan, and now we're talking about estate planning. So those and Sometimes I get those a little bit confused. I think of estate planning as the same over as a big part of transition planning, and they put it pretty late in the process here. Well, and that was kind of my thought process before I looked into a lot of this, too, is, well, what is the difference between a state plan and a transition plan? And there's a lot of overlap between the two, but they are definitely different. These states, you start thinking about state taxes, uh, wills come into play, the assets and wealth. So that's when you start thinking of state. But a transition plan can start... It could start. Age. You could be 40, 50, 60 years old when you're beginning to transition yep, yep. Yeah. from one stage a, to the that's next. That's a key point because that's when you may want to do that. Is because transition, you're moving some of that managerial things that could happen earlier, and then I still benefit from your knowledge. And then the final step they have is you put it all into action. It is okay. We went through this. I think probably it's pretty, multiple meetings. Multiple, multiple meeting, time. multiple months, probably multiple years, maybe in this case, complex. And yeah, you start to slowly transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, think, I think this is an important topic, and this is a good one to challenge you on because for most of us, this is really easy to put off. It's really easy oh. for me because there's no driver to say I need to do that today. And it's real easy to say, oh, I might do that in the future. I need to do that. I see mm-hmm. the importance. But I think these steps make it bite-sized and a little bit easier to, to go through. Do I need to have a, an outside expert like a lawyer involved in this transition planning? or? Well, or you know, I'm not sure you need to from a transition plan. Now, you could if you're thinking about changing business structure from a sole proprietor to a partnership to maybe some kind of corporate structure. If there are wills involved, I mean, if you start thinking about the there estate might be planning, some specific task for there a could lawyer be. or a, right. an accountant or something, but a lot of this is just going to be the the family itself. Right. Last topic I want to touch on, and we'll touch on it briefly, but heat stress, mm-hmm. because a lot of times we may have cattle that are out on pasture they're used to it they've got some shade although we may have cattle in with some of the we talked before about cover crops and some of the summer cover crops some of those pastures don't have shade don't have much shade what are the signs of yeah well the things that i'm really looking for are uh animals first of all not coming up and eating lower to head rapid breathing you know they're trying to dissipate heat in other ways they're going to cool off they don't sweat like we do no, they're they going to cool off by respiration so breathe. rapid breathing that, that's panting. one of the ways that they blow yep. off heat a couple of other key things is a lot of times that heat stress is going to peak late in the day first of all their, their rumen is full and so that's generating heat peak temperatures are later in the day and the other thing that and that i failed to say before was how much night cooling so Cattle can handle quite a bit of heat if they're able to dissipate the heat at night. And then another hot day tomorrow is not so bad. But if you have those hot, humid, still nights where they're not able to dissipate heat, then tomorrow can be a particularly high-risk day. Absolutely. And making sure that when possible, we've got shade, airflow, and water are are the key things. So manage that environment, keep a close eye on it, and intervene early if you start seeing some signs of heat distress. Bob Larson, Brad White, and Dustin Pendle of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. Listen to the podcast in full and look into subscribing to same at beefcattleinstitute.org. Beef Cattle Institute, all one word, dot O-R-G. We'll be back shortly here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And on to today's agricultural news headlines for you now, courtesy in part of DTN. The Office of the U.S. Trade Representative confirmed that Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin spoke with Chinese counterparts, but did not single which officials the two talked to, nor did they provide any information about what was discussed. However, the Xinhua News Agency said the talks were with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and Commerce Secretary Zhang Shang, with the two sides exchanging views on implementing the trade agreement between President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping in Osaka, Japan recently. The two sides also discussed the next steps for the consultations, according to the Ministry of Commerce statement referenced by Xinhua. Mnuchin had signaled last Thursday that the conversation was going to take place and also indicated it could lead to in-person talks. But so far, there have been no confirmations that an in-person round of talks has yet been officially scheduled. The Environmental Protection Agency will not ban the insecticide chlorpyrifos in response to a court order handed down back in April. An EPA spokesperson, however, told DTN on Friday the agency will expedite an ongoing review of chlorpyrifos in response to public concerns raised. The agency has until 2022 to complete its review. The agency had until July the 18th to address objections to its 2007 decision Decision, rejecting a petition asking for a ban. The deadline was set as part of a court order issued in April by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco. Chlorpyrifos, of course, the main ingredient in Corteva AgriSciences' lowers ban insecticide, which targets soybean aphids, spider mites, and corn rootworm. The EPA has consistently maintained that the available science supports the human safety of chlorpyrifos, while environmental groups continue to say that it is unsafe for humans. An EPA spokesperson told DTN the agency may at some point place new restrictions on chlorpyrifos. Now, the EPA has responded to some of the claims in recent years, according to this spokesperson, while assessing the available chlorpyrifos data, conducting risk assessments, and consulting an EPA scientific advisory panel on many of those claims raised. Corteva AgriScience said in a statement to DTN that company supports this ongoing review. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is seeking to fund more rural energy projects. We hear more on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA's Rural Energy for America program, or REAP, has $400 million left this fiscal year. The program assists agriculture producers primarily and also rural businesses with energy efficient improvements, such as improving their lighting or their refrigerator system or solar panels to help with their energy costs. That was Betty Brand, Rural Business Cooperative Service Administrator. The applications come in through our local state offices, and the sooner the better because in order to have money obligated for this fiscal year and to have access to this $400 million would be to get the applications in so we can get a guarantees approved before the end of our fiscal year, which is September 30th. One REAP project example involves a rural store in Maine that covered all of its energy needs by installing solar panels. So it was a complete trade-off, and immediately, once those things were installed, they saw those savings. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. On the calendar, the dates have been set now for the first two Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas State University Ranch Management Field Days. High Plains Ponderosa Dairy, a state-of-the-art commercial milking operation, will host the first event on August the 13th in southwest Kansas near Plains. On the program there, a look at external parasite management for beef cattle operations. A.J. Tarpoff of K-State will present that. Also an update on the cattle trace program from program manager Cassie Kniebel. And the general manager of High Plains Ponderosa Dairy, Greg Bethert, will take a look at the growing priority of consumer perception. That's the first of the field days on August the 13th at the High Plains Ponderosa Dairy near Plains. Jared and uh, Shauna Moyer of Moyer Farms LLC will be hosting the second field day on August the 15th. 
The Moyer family owns and operates a stocker operation just north of Emporia. On the program for that field day, the Lyon County Extension Agricultural Agent Brian Reese will take a look at identifying and understanding old world blue stem in the Flint Hills. K State's Dale Blassie on exploring possible economic advantages of using drones in livestock production. And again, Cassie Kniebel from Cattle Trace will update that program at that field day. Both of these will start with registration at 3 o'clock with the program proper at 3.30, and uh, there will be the beef dinner accompanying these field days of course for more information you can go to this website kla.org kla.org and find out more about the kla k-state ranch management field days coming up in august now it's on to this week's edition of tree tales with k-state forester charlie barden charlie a shade tree can be a joy to stand under in the summer do you know why it feels so good First, the shade tree makes you feel cooler because it directly blocks solar radiation from hitting you and being converted to heat. Also, most of that sunlight falling on the tree is being used to evaporate water from the leaves, which absorbs a tremendous amount of energy, and the tree acts like a giant evaporative cooler. Where should you plant shade trees in the landscape for the maximum effect? Not on the south side of a building unless they will be planted very close to the house, which is not usually recommended in our windy climate. Shade trees will help cool the house when planted to provide shade to windows and walls from the afternoon or morning sun, so planting on the east and west sides of your yard can work well. A well-shaded home will use much less energy for air conditioning. Another good spot for a shade tree is wherever you spend time outdoors, like near a patio or deck, or even just next to a picnic table or bench. By keeping these areas shaded, you will have a lot more use and enjoyment of them during our long, hot summers. An often overlooked place for a shade tree is the home's outside air conditioning unit. Providing shade to the AC will help it cool your home more efficiently and can reduce your electricity bill by up to 10%. Try to shade the unit with just one or two well-placed trees planted at least 10 feet away, as the unit also needs good airflow circulating around the cooling fins to operate efficiently. While summer is not the best time of year to plant new shade trees, it is an ideal time to evaluate the landscape to see where trees should be added and make plans to add them in the strategic locations this fall or next spring. You're listening to Tree Tales. This is Charles Barden of Forest with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Charlie. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman is standing by with that. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. The four-member Kansas 4-H team from Cowley County that won the State Wildlife Habitat Education Program competition in May competed in the national competition last week at the Rock Springs 4-H Center near Junction City. The Wildlife Habitat Education Program, or WEP, is a hands-on environmental education program that provides youth an opportunity to test their wildlife knowledge in a friendly competition. The national competition is a joint 4-H and FFA natural resource program that teaches wildlife and fisheries habitat management to youth. This year's national WEP competition focused on the Great Plains grassland, tall grass mixed prairie ecoregion. Kansas 4-H Program Coordinator Chris Mullins, who also provides oversight for the wildlife, shooting sports, and environmental sciences project areas, attended last week's national competition and was impressed by how well each team performed. Chris, you had the opportunity last week, along with a team from Kansas, to take part in a national wildlife competition. That's right. We had the National Wild Habitat Education Program at Rock Springs, and there was... 
17 teams throughout the United States that all got came together in teams of three and four and competed at Rock Springs. And what this program is, it's a really hands-on environmental education program, and it's really dedicated to teaching the kids about wildlife and fisheries and habitat management. So they were given like a task or some sort of a project to take on? There was many different aspects to this competition. There's, uh, it was broken up into four different sections. In the morning, they worked together as a team and evaluated a piece of property and suggested management techniques and practices based upon what the scenario of the landowner wanted. And then there was uh, another scenario where they assessed the habitats based upon the species, the indicated species that the landowner wanted to put together. And then in the afternoon, they had a oral defense where each one of the contestants came to a couple of judges and orally defended why they chose those habitat practices. And then they also had a wildlife ID and a bird ID as well. And prairie chickens was kind of the focus? For that scenario, uh, they were really managing, they were trying to manage for prairie chickens and a little bit of white-tailed deer. So these kids from all over the country learned about prairie chickens, learned what kind of habitats prairie chickens want and are looking for. And so they came together and built these practices to help increase the number of prairie chickens on this piece of property based upon the habitat preferences and the food sources. As you mentioned, this was a 4-H and an FFA project. Yes, this is a 4-H and FFA project, and it's really dedicated towards kids from ages 8 to 19. They had an opportunity then to have a state competition to really qualify to go to this national event? There was for here in Kansas. Both FFA and 4-H youth were able to compete here at K-State with Charlie Lee and Dr. Drew Ricketts. They helped put on the state competition here, and the winner was Cali County, and they were the ones who got to represent Kansas. And this was something unique for Kansas? Have we ever hosted this before? From my understanding, uh, the last time it was hosted was about 20 years ago, and actually Dr. Drew Ricketts competed in it. So it's been a quite a long time since this national competition has been to Kansas, and it was a real awesome opportunity that we were able to have it at Rock Springs. Opportunity for these youth from Cowley County to really get a taste of what it's like to compete on the national level. Oh, most definitely. And it was great to see kids and youth from all over all over the United States, really get to see Kansas is more than just cows and telephone poles and Dorothy, that's for sure. And they had a chance then to experience all of the things that go on out at Rock Springs. They did. They had a ice cream social, and I guess they had a swimming night, and they got to experience all of what Rock Springs had to offer. And I know I talked to a few of the youth, and they were really jealous that our 4-H camp is a lot better than their state's 4-H camp, so that was good to hear. (laughs) Another thing that you are in charge of is shooting sports, and there are a number of upcoming events that people might want to be aware of, especially if they're still in the process of qualifying for state competition. That's correct. So our state competitions are in September, and they're split based upon the disciplines, and we have quite a few regional qualifiers. One's coming up, Cali County, Reno County, Edwards, and Sedgwick, and they're all different disciplines. You can find this information on the K-State Shooting Sports website, and you can go underneath Fall Events, and they'll be all listed there, and you can click on the PDFs and be able to see when to apply and what the prices for those qualifying events are. And what are all of the different categories that they can participate in? Everything from shotgun to archery, muzzleloader, small bore rifle, small bore pistol. So it's quite a few, and there's a ton of kids. And if you don't have that opportunity, feel free to reach out to your county agents and talk to them about your shooting sports program. They'll be more than happy to get you hooked up with different coaches and get your kids back outside. This is one of those events where they do have to score at a certain level to qualify to move on. Yes, that's correct. To qualify for the state competitions, each each different practice has has a baseline score, which the youth will have to reach to be able to make it to the state competition. Can they continue to try until they, they make it, I they guess? They can. They can. So let's say a, a youth didn't qualify in shotgun the first time they competed. They were able to to attend other different regional competitions and county competitions to see if they can qualify and hit that number and then make it to state. I remember when my son did this, that there was practice throughout the year. So it's not just going to the competitions. There's the, I guess, really the the discipline of practicing quite often. Most definitely. There's, it just really depends on which county and which coaches you have. Some of these, some of these counties really get into it and they have practice multiple times a week. Some are less, a little less hands-on and uh, have practices once a week to once every other week. And it really just depends on the coaches and instructors and if how much that youth wants to get involved, they can have the opportunity of practicing multiple times depending on the discipline. 
safety is also a big component of this sport? Most definitely. Uh, we follow very strict guidelines with safety, and all of our instructors and coaches are certified nationally, and some are even educators and instructors for other national coaches. So that's awesome. I know we always think about the the BB guns and things like that, but archery can be just as dangerous. It can. Archery can be dangerous. Um, You never know. Some of the older equipment that gets brought into these regional competitions have cracked limbs, and you always worry about limbs breaking or strings being too worn and snapping during practice or even during the state competition. So we always go through You know, a random selection, just evaluate some of the equipment just for each one of the youth, just to see, you know, make sure that at the state competitions, everyone's safe and following the same guidelines. It looks like the season is kind of winding down. If someone is interested in getting into it, maybe in the next go around, that'll be on the website as well. It will be. So after this fall competition, our spring sports start up, and that's BB guns and then air rifle and air pistol. And that'll be all on the website as well. Okay, and that's Kansas4H.org. That's Kansas4H.org. That's Kansas 4-H program coordinator Chris Mullins. Again, to learn more about shooting sports or Kansas 4-H, contact your county or district extension office or visit Kansas4H.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network. <laughs>